What could I say of humans? I suppose I should start by saying that they are quite the curious species, prone to a level of inquisition and deduction that seems at often times unnecessary to a Thulu such as I. Though I suppose that is due to the fact that humans do not possess the same skills as those of my species. No other species does really, save the Nereids, but one could really consider their gifts as different as they are similar to ours. But back to the humans. I am not entirely sure where their propensity to ask questions of just about anything that strikes their mood comes from, but at times I cannot help but feel a sense of envy whenever I catch that spark of excitement behind their eyes, when I feel the gears moving inside their heads. Perhaps I should elaborate on that particular statement before we continue. We Thulus are a highly cerebral and interconnected species of creatures, capable of a mental communication far faster and more efficient than anything the other species can at this time can emulate. Normally I would say that this is a relative boon to our species, and it generally is, but such abilities tend to grow tiresome when combined with our own longevity, as we Thulus tend to be relatively tired of each other after a millennia spent together. This has led us to live relatively solitary lives, away from fellow members of our species, though we maintain enough connectivity throughout the Poros systems to keep our position of power relatively secure. Our lives are normally spent as merchants travelling through the galaxy, though a number of us have set up shop on a number of planets, much to the delight of some galactic powers and to the chagrin of others. We pay it no mind, for due to either a case of hubris on our part or a simple biological truth, there is a relatively few number of species that would even think to challenge us in the first place. You see, as I mentioned before, our mental connectedness to one another does not necessarily stay exclusive to just fellow Thulus, but extends its reach into the consciousness of other species. Simply put, we read minds, though the actual execution of such methods are far more nuanced than that. We do not just read minds, but are capable of suggesting a number of ideas to the minds we choose to delve into. This is, of course, common knowledge, leading to a number of defences developed on the part of other species, but the more adept of us are capable to slipping past these defences without our quarry necessarily noticing. Still, while we may be powerful, we are very much cautious of exuding too much influence over the galaxy. Direct conflict with any galactic power would result in needless losses and a drastic reduction in our market size. The phrase, there is a tentacle lurking in every shadow, is not without merit, however, though I pride myself on not being privy to such matters, to the extent that my colleagues are, of course. But enough about my species. We are talking about humans, are we not? Our first contact with the humans is a story not many would suspect. It occurred far before the humans had even taken their first steps outside their planet, on their very home of Earth. The exact date would be May 23rd, 1904, where due to a miscalculation of our initial testing of the space displacement drive, or if you wish to use the human vernacular, the punch drive, caused one of our test pilots to warp directly into the Providence River in the middle of the city of Providence, Rhode Island. Thankfully, the pilot survived the excursion, but upon entry, he caused quite the disturbance to the underwater environment of the river. It was nighttime, meaning the amount of people who could have seen it at that time would have been minimal, but there was one human who witnessed the event. A young boy by the name of Howard. I would like to say that our test pilot kept themselves hidden, but Gatanota was always the adventurous sort and approached the boy from the depths of the river. I imagine, at least from what I can surmise from human thought process, that young Howard must have been equal parts terrified and fascinated to see such a large creature to emerge from the depths. Perhaps more terrified, for he fled from my son as soon as he saw him break the surface. Gatanota could not return to us for some time for his drive was damaged after the initial testing. 
Easily reparable, mind you, but you can imagine how difficult it is to scavenge materials from the murky depths of a river whilst thousands of humans are lurking by. He was not alone, however, for Howard eventually returned to the river, his curiosity eventually overcoming his fear. Biologically, that was probably a foolish decision, but I suppose there should be some lenience given to a thirteen-year-old in human standards, of course. I do not know what possessed my son to speak to the boy at that time, but I can only guess that the boy's own inquisitive nature has resonated with the Thulu's own. His own isolation must have played a part as well, because even though he likes to describe his time on Earth as a pleasant reprieve from our constant thoughts, he was certainly in a more chatty mood upon his return. So, while Gata Nota gather materials at night, he spoke with Howard during the day. The process took far longer than he thought, for humans proved rather hard to manipulate through our usual methods of suggestion. Normally, it is not hard to manipu, coerce someone into doing what you want to do. A small suggestion here. An elevated level of importance of a particular thought or idea there. And soon the people we speak to become far more agreeable to our terms. Now, while it is certainly not a rare occurrence to run into the particularly resistant member in any species, humans, on average, possess far more resistance to these subtle methods. Tenacity appears to be hard-coded into human DNA itself, and from what we can derive from examining their thought processes, they tend to be as much creatures of habit as much as they are to enacting great change. Their disposition towards habitual behavior, however, is in this case a boon to their mental defenses. Manipulation of the consciousness is by no means an easy feat, but manipulation of the subconscious is another thing entirely. Though the humans themselves most likely do not realize it, much of how they act is largely determined by their own subconscious functions. The tone with which they speak, the meaning they place in seemingly worthless objects, trauma, endearment, even posture, every seemingly innocuous aspect of a being's behavior has an underlying component of subconscious influence beneath them. This is true for all species, but for humans the effect is noticeable larger than any we have encountered before. Let us say that the average sentient species in the galaxy possess a 70-30 distribution of conscious behavior over unconscious behavior. For humans, that distribution is 50-50. Because of this, subconscious influence is weaved into every aspect of a human's actions, making influencing these behaviors far more difficult than any other species on average. It is due to this reason that humans have generated a reputation of tenacity among the other galactic powers, a reputation that is not given lightly, since, as I mentioned before, we Thulus find it a more difficult but not impossible task to influence the mind of a human. Such was the case for Gatanota when he arrived on Earth. Rather than Suggesting to the populace to leave the required materials near his location, like he would have normally done, he had to resort to either gathering the materials himself or focusing on a single human to do his work for him. It was a highly inefficient process, and it was because of this that he did not return to us for months. This gave our test pilot much time to discuss things with Howard, who more than lived up to the reputation of human curiosity. There was no one specific things that Howard focused on in his questions, and instead, the young boy wanted to know practically everything there was to know about our species. It was quite flattering, at least according to Gatanota, and he did his best to tell Howard of our people. He explained our method of communication, which back then consisted of delivering messages directly into the minds of the individuals we spoke to. Since these messages were configured to fit the mind of the person we spoke to, it would be understood in their own language. Of course, this was eventually determined to be too intrusive for most species, since hearing voices in your head tended to make the subject feel more like they were descending into madness rather than eliciting a normal dialogue. 
Fortunately for Gattanota, Howard seemed to have little problem with this method of communication, or hid his opinions of it deep in his mind. Beyond communication, however, Howard also asked us of our culture, of our people and our traditions. It was a difficult question for Gattanota to fully answer, since even with our mental connectedness with one another, there were so few of us in number that our dynamics were more similar to a group of friends rather than an entire civilization. Friends that are often tired of each other's presences, but friends nonetheless. If there was any culture that was related to us, it would have to belong to the Ivalu, beings who lived deep in the depths of our ocean planet and took early on to looking upon we Thulus as sorts of divine deities. I cannot say that we rejected such perceptions as having a willing species who possessed a much smaller stature and willingness to accept our mental machinations made them a highly utilitarian sort. When Gattanota explained this to Howard, the boy likened our symbiotic relationship with the Ivalu to slavery. Gattanota tried to explain otherwise, but Howard did not seem to budge on this subject. That said, it should be said that the Ivalu have garnered some more independence since this exchange. A normal development as technology has progressed throughout the years. Our relationship with them remains strong, and many of us maintain a majority of Valu crew amongst our ships, as they remain the species most malleable to our needs. Beyond our relationship with the Ivalu, Howard asked our test pilot of the rest of us, Gatanota explained to the boy that the Thulu possess two selves. Our physical selves, something we all share in common, are most similar to the cephalopods found in Earth's oceans, albeit with a few variations. However, where we Thulus truly differ from one another in, in our mental selves. Howard's was confused by this, which is understandable for one first encountering us, but as Gattanota elaborated, he slowly began to understand. Gattanota explained to the boy that our more cerebral selves are most similar to the concept of mental projections. Whenever we unleash the full extent of our abilities, the manifestation of this psychic power replaces the representations of ourselves in the physical world. For example, Gattanota's mental self, when fully unleashed, represents a mass of tentacles and gaping maws. It is a terrifying form, to be honest, but appropriate for an explorer such as he. Though I will say that my son could have used a bit more finesse when manifesting his form. Gattanota did not stop with his own mental self, however, and described a number of other forms to the boy. Oki. He first talked of his siblings, Igotha and Zothom, who took forms quite different from his own. Igotha had taken to the Ivalu at a young age, and as such took a form quite similar to their own, that of a humanoid frog to put it into the simplest terms. Though he chose to have only one eye in such a form, for reasons I cannot fathom. Zothom, however, chose a mental representation that was a hybrid of a number of species he saw throughout his years. He kept the tentacles of his physical form, but attached them to a large set of fins and a reptilian head. My son did not stop there, however, and spoke of my grandfather, Yosagoth, whom took upon the visage of a mass of eyes and tentacles. He even mentioned my own form, perhaps the one that is most similar to our physical selves. I have never been one for frills, so a more humanoid form, tall and imposing, was enough for one such as I, and it has served me well throughout the years. There are also those of us that have kept their forms hidden from even us, most notably our species progenitor Azathoth, who has gone into complete isolation from us. Of course, this was all merely explanation on Gattanota's part, for to show Howard our actual mental selves would have subjected the boy to a mental strain that would be near impossible to bear. The effects differed among us, of course, but if I were to be specific to Gattanota himself, sight of his mental projection would result in instant rigor mortis, yet keep the victim's brain functioning. 
You can understand that the initial shock of this occurring creates a large enough trauma that the subject usually descends into madness. If not, the paralysis is permanent, meaning that the subject will be able to think but not move, which will eventually cause the deterioration of the mind. As I have mentioned, however, this effect is singular to Gatanota himself, but generally sight of our mental selves results in the victim's descent into madness, though that was in the past. With the advent of more advanced technologies, most species have been able to protect themselves from such shocks. Though we do not display our mental selves as frequently as we once did, as doing so would more than likely result in our current clientele adopting more cautious approaches to us. Back then, however, the result of such actions would prove fatal to even the humans, and given how fond Gatanota was of the boy, he refused Howard's request to show him such a form. Their time was already coming to a close regardless, as Gatanota repaired his space displacement drive and was set to jump back to our home planet of Yugoth, but there was a disagreement in how we Thulus should have handled the situation with Howard. You see, Gatanota's journey to Earth is perhaps the first case of outside contact with another species, so there was no way of telling of what the young boy would do with the information that my son had given him at the time. Though this general knowledge of my kind is commonplace among the galaxy today, in the past we Thulus were very secretive of our abilities. Having that sort of leverage goes a long way in negotiations, and to be honest, it is much easier to influence people if they to know nothing about our abilities. That is what made the situation with Howard quite complicated. There was very little Malik detected in the boy, according to Gatanota, yet his observations of the other humans told him that there was a chance, albeit very small, that the boy could end up being a threat if he grew to be someone who possessed a large amount of influence. In hindsight, it would have been wise to keep the boy untouched, as it would have allowed my kind to keep a foothold within human society, and would have possibly given us a little more leverage in our current business dealing today. We could not have subdu worked with them the way that we do the Ivalu, but such a relationship would have been beneficial to us in the long run. This makes what we did with Howard all the more regrettable. Gatanota was against the idea, but we decided that it was for the best that we wiped the boy's memory of his interactions with my son. However, since Gatanota refused to perform the deed himself, my daughter Scyther decided to take it upon herself to perform the task. However, since this was the first time she experienced the mind of a human, her touch was less than subtle on the young boy's mind. For the longest time, we thought Howard's mind to be broken, that we essentially reduced him into a catatonic state of mind. We decided to withhold this information from Gatanota, but when he eventually found out he set off for Earth once again. When he arrived, however, he found that not only had the boy lived, but that he remembered much of what my son told him. There were some differences, most notably the spelling of our names, but Howard instead translated much of what was told to him in the form of fiction stories. Again, most likely due to Scyther's own mistakes in handling the memory-wiping process, much of the information that Howard wrote down was, for the most part, altered in some way to reconcile the knowledge he already possessed to fit his own worldview. There was much truth to Howard's writings, but also much creative license with the knowledge he had. Unfortunately, we were unable to fix these mistakes in Howard's writings as he passed by the time Gatanota returned to Earth. However, to remedy this, my son started to interact with others, subtly and out of the way this time, to add on to the works that Howard produced. He never told us why he did so, but eventually Howard's works were expanded upon, refined, until they reached an almost completely accurate account of my species. Of course, the humans that received this information always translated it into works of fiction, and not all works were consisted with one another, but I must say I was impressed by their work.
though I was uncertain if I should have taken their malicious, godlike depictions of us as flattery or an indication of how they would treat us upon meeting them in the vastness of space. Gatanota left Earth before he could see the results of his machinations, and we did not see them for three more centuries. However, the memory of Howard never left us, but while some of us remembered the boy fondly, I looked upon him with a note of caution. If a mere boy could somehow withstand a direct encounter with not only my son, but also my daughter, who displayed to the boy far more psychic power than most living beings can take, and still retain his sanity and retain the information that he had been given, what did that mean for the rest of the humans? There were still millions, perhaps billions, that did not know of us by the time they met us among the stars, but the information that Howard and those that built upon his writings gave humanity settled humanity's perceptions of space to accept the otherworldly, making their technical first contact with us quite... interesting. Our first official meeting with the humans, according to their history, was in the depths of the Poros systems, where a human by the name of Stephen Henry was undergoing, he called his journey across the eternal spiral. When he met us, he was alone, flying in a small frigate-class ship, more suited for exploration than any sort of defence, and was easily dwarfed by the size of our own ships, built around us like a suit of armour. When he encountered us, however, the first reaction he had wasn't one of fear, but instead laughter and a question that told us everything we needed to know. So Lovecraft was right all along? There is something to be said about humanity's capacity for change. Such a concept is present in other species, of course, but for, say, the Resinaga, change tends to suit the purposes of their natural dispositions. The Resinaga are conquerors, through and through, so their drive for change remains central to the concepts of conquest and subjugation. It is an effective drive, as evidenced by their current state of power in the galaxy, but it is also very singular. This made it simple to stop them from intruding upon our space in the Poros systems, for their tactics very much coincided with their basic beliefs, and that is overwhelming strength. Like all species they encountered, the Resonaga sought to conquer us, but such a like-minded society was, let us say, devout in their methods of warfare. Even when we were not looking into their minds, we could tell when the Resonaga would strike, how they would strike, and what was the breaking point for their fleets to retreat. This made our conflict with them a fairly brief one, one fought amongst themselves for the most part. I will admit that the Resonaga have a naturally hardline disposition to their mentality that makes it initially difficult for us to manipulate, but the issue with them at that time at least, was that when we figured out how to break one, it was a simple task to break the rest. To them, they were merely fighting the Ivalu, who had put up a valiant physical effort against the overwhelming strength of the Empire, but they never noticed our machinations in the shadows until it was too late. We manipulated half of their assaulting fleet into attacking their own, altering their minds to see only more foes to conquer, and not their comrades in arms. Doing this, as well as inflaming their natural bloodlust and zeal for combat past the point of reason, resulted in them nearly destroying each other by the time the battle was done. What little ships that did leave never returned, of course, and for the longest time they branched out to conquer the rest of the galaxy, treating their encounter with us as if it never had happened. That appears to be the general consent among their populace, though I suspect the Empress is very aware of our capabilities. The recent negotiators from the Empire have been fairly difficult to deal with, though I am unsure if that is due to technological advances or due to a change in mindset at this point. The Coalition as well represents a single like-minded drive though this appears to be the result of a cultural and societal conditioning rather than a natural disposition like the Resonaga. That is to be expected, of course, 
as the Coalition has the most diverse spread of species in the galaxy within their ranks. Whether or not they are utilizing this diversity to its fullest extent is another thing entirely, but that is a matter for them to figure out for themselves. What is important to note here, as I have mentioned before, is that despite their physical differences amongst each other, it is very easy to tell when someone is part of a coalition. As with all individuals, there are variations, but the prominence of inclusiveness, equality, and depreciation of the self among them makes adjusting to them as simple as it was with the Rezanaga. They had initially approached us for aid when they first broke from the Empire, thinking to incorporate us within their ranks. A reasonable move from our perspective, but very different in motive when we looked into their minds. They simply came to us to be inclusive rather than anything rational like wanting to use our abilities against the Empire to their advantage. Their pure intent was disarming in a way, and some of us even felt the urge to help them just because of that. They soon came to their senses, however, and saw an opportunity of a different kind. We assisted them in their war against the Empire by supplying them with the needed resources, but never in excess. Rather, we gave them a bit below the bare minimum telling them that it was all we could do to supply them with the current amount we had then. They took us at our word, for their battle with the Rezanaga was won on an ideological scale. Knowing this, we knew they would never spend the time to look into our sources nor our true beliefs, of which we have none. In fact, all we had to do was to deliver the package, or in this case resources, to them telling them that we were behind them completely and to keep up the good fight. They truly believed us to be on their side, while never knowing that another species that we had taken a liking to, the Migo, had dealt with and traded with the Empire. Of course, the Empire did not know the Migu's connections with us either, making the Second Galactic Civil War a fairly profitable venture for us overall. The outcome of the war, however, was the one thing we could not predict. We had predicted that the Coalition would lose the war, due to the Rezanaga's own aggressive nature having an edge in combat over the Coalition's own ideological harmony. It doesn't mean the, the Rezanaga are a superior species, but just that their own methodology was more suited to combat. It was a truly regrettable outcome, but we saw it as the natural way of things. It would still be profitable to interact with the Rezanaga with the Migu, but to have two powers, both rich in resources and different in demands, would have been the optimal outcome. We were realistic with our expectations, however, and expected the inevitable to happen. That is, until the humans entered the war. Past our initial encounter with Stephen Henry in our space, we did not speak to the humans as often as we expected to. Granted, this was most likely due to the fact that the Poros systems and UPN space were separated by what was once Empire space, now Coalition. This divide made it fairly difficult to deal with the humans in any grand capacity, so what they were capable of was still somewhat of a mystery to us. The humans that Gatanota saw during Howard's time seemed to be very much in their growing pains as a society and there was little we could conclude from Stephen's spacecraft other than the fact that humanity had developed their own space displacement drive and were capable of spaceflight. An impressive feat for a species not uplifted by the Empire, but we had no idea how impressive they had become until the battle at Apura V. They had not only become a species that could navigate the stars, but possessed a strength and power that would allow them to conquer it. The destruction of the Ricasolis was the first time we saw the true might of the human spirit, and it shook some of us. The following charge of the human fleet into Empire space and subsequent defeat of Empress Shechu was not much of a surprise after that, but the Treaty of Itraxi was. We had not involved ourselves in the negotiation of the treaty's terms, as the Poros systems had incurred virtually no damage during the war but that did not mean we didn't keep an eye on its development. 
Should the treaty have held any clauses that were potentially harmful to our interest, an alteration would have to have been made. What the humans had done instead, however, was bring about a situation that was relatively beneficial to us. By allowing both the Empire and the Coalition to exist, as well as making the restoration of the Fractus systems a top priority, the humans had not only created a more open market to profit from, but also created a large opportunity for us to assist with. This situation did not come without some notes of worry, however, as there was something different about the humans of this time. When we encountered Stephen, there seemed to be a difference to him compared to those of his kind in the past. He and Howard shared the same sense of curiosity between each other, but there was an air of confidence around Stephen. We did not know if that was exclusive to him as an individual, but it was a large enough presence in his mind that it piqued our own curiosity for the first time in many years. Of course, with that curiosity came a note of caution. Stephen's mind was far more guarded than the humans of Howard's time, and we suspect that it could be due to humanity's own impulse to consider not just one possibility, but many. Howard's writings might be works of fiction, and perhaps not even the first to introduce the concepts of mind-reading to the humans, but what they had done was further push humanity to consider the very possibility of such an ability to exist. Stephen may have held a jovial tone in his talks with us, but if Howard was correct in one aspect of his fiction, what was to stop the man from believing everything else that was written as well? When attempting to look into the explorer's mind, we were met with a resistance that shocked even Gatanota, who up until that point had the most experience with humans. We could still interact with Stephen through mental communications, but beyond a few emotions and the occasional fleeting thought, his mind was closed to us. Had he stayed a little longer with us, we would have been able to break past these defences, but he left soon after his encounter with us. I am of the mind that he must have suspected that we were attempting to peer into his mind, and left before any information could have been leaked. An overly cautious sentiment that did not fit the man's openness to discussion, but the only logical conclusion I am able to come up with. If one man could put up so much resistance, then what was to be assumed about the rest of his species? Even if Stephen himself was an outlier, what Howard had done with his fiction was take away one of our greatest advantages, and that was our mystery. It appears that Howard had made fear of the unknown a popular concept amongst humans, but rather than be shackled by this fear, the humans sought to eliminate this fear altogether by pursuing all types of knowledge. At the same time, however, the prominence of their subconscious mind in their behaviours serves as a filter of sorts, screening out the ideas that appear to be nonsensical or not yet plausible. What this does is balance change with habitual stability, which makes humanity develop at a steady rate of change, rather than through sharp spurts of growth like the other galactic powers. As I have mentioned before, it is not that the other galactic powers are not an imaginative sort. In fact, given the distribution of the conscious mind over the subconscious mind that other species have, they should have a larger creative mind than the humans. However, it is due to this very reason that the other galactic powers do not possess much variation of thought, at least on the surface. I say this because the very nature of the conscious mind is one that is easily influenced by outside information. The conscious mind is considered to be creative in this aspect because it is more accepting of outside ideas and able to be influenced far easier in this regard. Theoretically, what this does for a species is keep them in a constant state of change due to how easily their minds can be influenced by mere ideas. 
However, what results instead is that one idea or group of ideas gains prominence over the others and pressures the other dissenting opinions out of existence due to the naturally low resistance on the part of the conscious mind. Of course, this frame of mind is still subject to change, but it is of a more orderly sort of change. That cannot be said of humanity, whose own patterns of change can be seen as chaotic at best. Ironically, this chaotic nature of human change is the result of the stability brought upon from their own subconscious behaviors. Humans in general seem to possess a frame of mind that does not outright reject change, but executes it in a far more unpredictable manner. Imagine, if you will, the act of throwing a glass orb against a wall. If the wall is made of something weak, say paper, the orb should essentially burst right through the wall. Now say that the wall is made of something much harder, like stone. When the orb strikes it, it shatters into small pieces, scattering in many different directions. The wall of paper represents a fully conscious mind, while the wall of stone represents a fully subconscious mind, and the glass orb represents change. Now let us say that the wall is made of something soft, but not as weak as paper. A sheet of foam in this instance. When the orb is thrown at this, there is a small initial resistance on the part of the foam, but eventually the material gives way and the orb makes its way through relatively unscathed. That is the state of mind for most species in this galaxy. For humans, imagine a thin, flexible sheet of wood. When the glass orb is thrown at this wall, it shatters, but not without causing a crack in the wood. Through this crack, small bits of the glass will make their way through. Sometimes it will be a large portion of the glass, and other times no glass will make it through at all. That is the nature of humanity's disposition to change. The wooden board in this case is a representation of the 50-50 distribution of the conscious mind over the subconscious mind. It is flexible but sturdy at the same time. This is what makes it so difficult for Thulus to influence anything in part of the humans, but also leaves them open to change through discussion and deliberation of ideas. The glass orb, change, shatters when meeting the resistance of the human mind, causing it to splinter in many different directions. This is what has caused the diversity of thought amongst humans to remain a constant in their civilization. That heightened sense of resistance to outside ideas in fact creates and splinters that single idea into many different ideas. Humans have a tendency to question even the most sensible of ideas, which is a result of their subconscious resistance to immediate change. If they so much as feel in the back of their minds that something does not feel right, they will speak out against it. The 70-30 distribution of other species, on the other hand, is much like the foam, with an initial resistance that eventually gives way to that singular idea. Glass will not shatter if not met with the right amount of resistance, and it appears that humanity has achieved or was merely born with that balance of resistance and flexibility that both breaks and allows the glass to come through. What this results in is, in multiple different directions, that change is implemented. Most know this as the human system of safety nets, but what the most alarming part of this method of change is that it is completely unpredictable, yet ironically within the realm of possibility. If the Thulus represented the chaos of the unknown, the humans in this way represented the chaos of what is already known. They are a constantly fluctuating species, making them hard to predict and plan against. What we could develop for one set of humans could be completely false for another group of a different frame of mind, and it is this divergence in thought that serves as their greatest societal defense against our own machinations. There is no way to appeal to all of humanity at once, and it is because of the variation of thought alongside by their own subconscious defenses 
that makes them possibly the most troublesome species for us to deal with in this galaxy, a problem that only continues to grow because it is due to their own curiosity that the realm of what is known grows and what is unknown shrinks. Rather than physically evolving over the years, the humans have developed a mindset that has resulted in a mental evolution that continues the more that they find out about the universe. To make this even more bothersome, this evolution occurs within their own subconscious, making it something that we cannot even prevent. It is not stretched to say that the Thulus are masters of conscious thought, but humans, whether knowingly or not, have become masters at altering the very subconscious themselves. Perhaps it is because of this skill of their that the other galactic powers have become more difficult to handle as of late. Ever since the Treaty of Itraxi, humanity has become more involved in the realm of galactic politics, and as soon as they did show their might to the galaxy, things have changed. It is most likely subtle to the rest of the galaxy, but there has been an alarming shift in attitude amongst the powers because of this. The Rezanaga have begun to run their own operations from the shadows, since they no longer possessed the overwhelming strength they thought they had, and they have steadily begun to develop an aggressive yet persuasive method of diplomacy that has taken some time to adjust to. The coalition has become more guarded of their activities, and no longer makes as much entreaties towards us to become a part of their civilization. Even when they do, there is something different to their minds, a sense of ambition and also a tinge of secrecy to their efforts. Perhaps it has something to do with the discovery of numerous Far Shah relics within their space, as the technology that have begun developing is impressive to say the least. These developments could merely be a natural progression of their own civilizations, but these recent developments coincide with the end of human isolationism, too much to be a coincidence. Their introduction into the galaxy was bombastic, to say the least, and with it came a small subconscious shift among the galaxy. The other powers felt something wrong with their methods when looking at the humans, and as a result, have adjusted accordingly which adds a new element of uncertainty to our dealings with them. This has brought a sense of fear among some of my kind, a feeling that we have not felt in a long time. With that fear, however, also comes an excitement amongst my species. We finally had ourselves a competitor, one that not only challenged us themselves, but also provoked those subject to our manipulations to compete against us as well. There has been a sense of stagnation amongst my kind as of late, perhaps one that has been brought about by our own devices, but with the introduction of the humans, we have met a species that does not alter the ways of the galaxy through meticulation, but instead through natural whims and drive. We do not know what will come about from this new element of change, but if humanity is involved, the only thing that we can predict is that it will be unpredictable. We Thulu are a logical sort. It does not do well with us to feel empathy, for by our very nature to be empathetic would in fact be a serious burden. Spending time in so many people's heads, sometimes involuntarily, requires a bit of emotional disconnection on our part, Elsewise, we would be caught up in everyone's tragic story or illogical impulses. Given the sheer size of the population in the galaxy, to do such a thing would cripple my species through triviality, a problem we have dealt with back before we even left the boundaries of Yugoth, where the Ivalu and Migu nearly overwhelmed us with an emotional load from their constant prayers. We learned from this and have since refined our mentality. To that effect, we only look for two things when peering into one's mind, what we can learn and what can we use. You may think it a harsh way to use abilities, but it is a necessary measure to ensure the safety of my species. Many conflicts, many wars have been avoided using this method, and even if it has resulted in the Thulu's dominance of the Poros systems, then that is a price we are willing to pay. But I am getting sidetracked. 
What has resulted from this adjust in mindset among my species is what we have come to see as the galactic system. When looked at from a broad perspective, it is easy to predict the ebb and flow of galactic society. Person A says X, person B responds with Y. Given how simple-minded the Empire was, this made it all the easier to manipulate and bend them to our needs whenever they interacted with us. Their sect of the Divine was a more complicated beast, seemingly adjusted to the shadows as much as ourselves. But even they still held the weaknesses that many Rezanaga held at the time, and that was their simplistic view of the world, which was to conquer everything they deemed weaker than themselves. As you would imagine, such a mindset is bound to create a certain degree of resentment among those that were conquered. If one were to say, heighten this sense of anger among the populace, what do you think you happen? The first galactic civil war was very much a product of our own machinations, though I will commend the Empire on its ability to quell such an uprising so quickly. However, what they failed to realize is that the mere act of rebellion scarred the perceptions of the Empire. It showed to the general populace that an uprising was in fact possible, and even if it failed, in the end it created martyrs for the downtrodden. The Empire may have quelled the rebellion brought about by our own influences, but in doing so, they had created the foundations for a second rebellion, one driven by a refined, if not overly pure, ideology, rather than inflamed hatred. What the founders of the coalition who now head its council had done was imagine the heroes of the First Galactic Civil War as warriors that fought for the same ideals they held, and they strove to complete what they had started. In reality, the rebels of the First Rebellion were in fact more brutal than the Empire themselves. But history tends to muddy as time goes on, and in the end, all that is remembered of the First Rebels is that they fought the Empire, and that gave the Coalition the drive it needed to break from them. We predicted such a thing would happen, because due to the countless number of minds my people have read, we learned that people, regardless of species, tend to project their own biases out into the world. By creating that first, albeit brief, rebellion within the Empire, we further sowed the seeds of discontent among their populace, and even if the rebellions ended up never succeeding, it disrupted the Empire enough to keep them from becoming overly powerful while we made a profit from the shadows. It was all part of the galactic system, one that in part was of our own design. It goes without saying that humanity has disrupted this system, but to explain the extent at which they have done so is a fairly long and arduous process that frankly is too tedious to explain. The most obvious example, as I have already mentioned before, would be their entry into the Second Galactic Civil War and how their sudden thrust into the center of attention caused a mental shift among the general population that has taken some time to adjust to. But it goes beyond just that. I suppose I should first provide a background to what I wish to talk about. We Thulu are the first species, as far as we are aware of, to develop the space displacement drive, and thus the first to begin intergalactic travel to far-off worlds. Now, communication is something that the Thulu have never found difficult, considering our own abilities. But as other species, most notably the Rezanaga, started to expand out into the stars, the barriers of communication between the species became very evident. Solving this problem was not as simple as learning language, as biological differences between species have caused a number of different methods of speech to develop. Be it from higher pitches of speech that some cannot hear, to purely visual speech that others cannot interpret due to the amount of colors they can or cannot see, to even speaking through smells, Communication cannot simply be learned across biological boundaries. As you can imagine, this inability to understand one another often lead to conflict and misunderstanding, and though we certainly were able to profit off war, there is only so much conflict even we can handle before it becomes too much. 
Using our understanding of each species' mind, we then developed the Universal Translator Implant, or UTI for short. The UTI, which is implanted into the parietal lobe of the brain, serves as the interpretation device that is used throughout the galaxy. The implant enhances the translation function of the lobe, which allows the user to pick up and translate the different speech cues from each species. Even if they do not smell certain smells or see certain colors, the implant does and translates these signals into something that the user can register for themselves, which is generally into a language they can recognize. Distribution of this technology, as well as keeping it complicated enough so it was not easily replicable, was an arduous task. But by distributing the technology through trades with the Migu and Ivalu, we were able to spread and sell the UTI across the galaxy. Even the humans, who were pondering their own solutions for communication, accepted the devices eagerly. This was a particularly profitable venture for us, and most likely reduced much conflict throughout the galaxy, even if most of it was under the foot of the Rezanaga at the time. Following this, our next subject of interest was intergalactic communications. Speaking to one another in the same star system with mere radio waves is not without its delays, but it is still manageable. Communicating across the stars with such a method would result in messages being delayed for quite some time, and that is putting it lightly. FTL communication had been developed at this time, but it was done ship to ship and planet to planet, which made for poor reception across the galaxy due to possible interference between points. At certain times, signals had to be bounced from ship to ship, which was only a moderately better solution, but was unreliable due to constant movement on part of the ships. To transmit the signal, as well as maintain the reception, it was important to install relays at certain points across the galaxy, something we put into effect in the Poros systems. The Empire had come to the same conclusion, but when they had, they realized that billing such relays across their far more expansive space was costly to save the least. We predicted this, and in fact even hoped for it, for from there, it was a matter of having the Migu offer to build the relays in Empire space for a much cheaper price than the Rezanaga were willing to do it themselves. Not too cheap, as we still aimed a profit, and to offer a lower price would make them suspicious to our intentions. They accepted the Migu's offer, and when the Intergalactic Communication System, or ICS, was put into place, it managed to shorten intergalactic delays to a manageable scale. It did not eliminate them, however, which was to our benefit. Since the delivery of a message is not necessarily instantaneous, it was possible for us to, let us say, examine the contents of certain key messages for potentially vital information before they arrive to their recipient. As useful as our gifts are, we cannot read the minds of people on different planets, making the development of the intelligence community crucial to our methods. To that effect, we built an access point into each relay, something only a Thulu may access and peer into as we desired. For you see, information is probably, if not more, profitable than the trading of goods. We are as much information brokers as we are merchants, selling company and government secrets, even personal information to the highest bidder. We would keep some secrets to ourselves, of course, for our own personal gain. By keeping access to this back door for only us, Thulu, we maintained an advantage on the collection of information, and no one, save the Migu and Ivalu, were aware of our efforts. The occasionally crafty hacker could find these access points themselves, but they were usually dealt with before word could get out. So long as we let the Empire believe at that time, the time that the Migu were the ones solely involved in the building and programming of the relays, then they had no reason to suspect us. You may ask why the Rezanaga never just conquered the Migu and forced them to do their bidding, and our answer related back to the initial conflict the Rezanaga had with the Ivalu. Their defeat in the Poros systems 
and they very nature of their defeat had instilled a sense of fear and caution amongst the Empire at that time. They had never seen us physically, but our touch on their minds told them that there was something lurking in the Poros systems, something that, even with their own military prowess, they would be very foolish to fight. How much of that feeling was instilled by us directly or indirectly is another matter entirely, but it served as a sort of psychological shield for the Migu. The Empire knew they originated from the Poros systems, and that was enough for the Empire to leave them be. So long as the Migu did their job and left them alone, they paid them no mind, which again was to our benefit. It was a good system to maintain, as it greatly benefited us with information and still provided a good enough communication to suit the needs of the rest of the galaxy's denizens. It was perhaps this very reason that explains why we never thought to develop any superior technology than what we had developed. Then, of course, the humans intervened. The demand for government information skyrocketed after the war, and espionage had become a new avenue of business for us. Given that the coalition was still part of the Empire when the relays were installed, we found it within our best interest to monitor the new fledgling power. Monitoring both the Empire and Coalition was a simple task, for reasons I have already described, but conducting inquiries on human matters required a different sort of effort. They had rejected the offer to install our relays in our space, instead opting to build their own. A reasonable decision, one that we were not fond of, but reasonable nonetheless. Greasing a politician's palms can only get you so far, and the offer for more information to the lower parts of an organization more than often results in a disgruntled rant on part of a jaded employee that gives at most a sliver of information. Any possible targets we could read had received some training in mental defense, meaning that if we were to commit to any one human to analyze, it would have to be timed where a long disappearance would not be considered suspicious. There were some humans that gave information to us willingly, and that was usually in the form of personal information that could be used for blackmail. These were few and far between for it appeared that humans preferred stabbing each other in the back rather than letting us do it for them. It is because of this that we first became aware of the humans' intentions when picking up a series of messages sent between Empire and Coalition Space. As you can imagine, seeing a steady stream of communications between two opposing powers was perplexing to say the least. It was not only the source, but also the very nature of the messages themselves that were confounding. They were dictionaries, accounting for every single species in both empire and coalition space. These dictionaries were presented in both auditory and visual formats, and in the case of smell, a list of chemical or pheromone combinations. There were also multiple versions of the same language, but upon closer look we realized that they varied between dialects. They were sharing languages, but for what reason we could not guess. It was not until we intercepted a message from UPN Space that everything had become clear. It was a fairly complicated file to crack, but the its contents eventually revealed themselves to us. Finished up the new translation algorithms. Take a look here. John. Attached to this message was a series of algorithms that we recognized immediately. It was the coding of the UTI, which we had purposely hid from most of the galaxy when developing the device. The humans, presumably this John, had somehow managed to crack the protections of the UTI and then modified its code. As we explained before, the UTI translated alien languages into a familiar language that one could recognize, but that did not mean it translated it into something the subject would know. To use a human example, if a human from Britannia heard, say, a Rezinaga speak, the word spoken could sound more like Japanese than English to them. It was recognizable, but it still required knowledge of a different language to learn. 
We kept this feature of the device because it still allowed enough of an understanding along with misunderstanding to keep the discontent amongst the people to manageable levels. There would be no large collapse of discourse but enough to profit from. What John had done was eliminate that source of misunderstanding by not only modifying the code to compensate for these different interplanetary languages and dialects, but also by requesting both the Empire and Coalition to compile a codex of these languages. He created a unifying moment for the galaxy, one that quelled some of the animosity between the Coalition and Empire, at least on the citizen level. We were most surprised by the Empire's participation in the project, as we had reason to believe they still held much resentment towards the humans. Perhaps their new Empress was more logical than their last. We obviously prepared for the impending release of this new UTI by producing a version like it on our own, but the humans, Coalition and Empire all released their new versions of this UTI into the market as we did, effectively eliminating our monopoly over the market. The humans, however, also released this product not too long after the war, which allowed their own products to penetrate the markets of the Coalition by pure association with goodwill. The Empire was more self-reliant but we managed to maintain a foothold in their society due to some of the populace still holding some wariness for the government. Compared to the time before the development of these new devices, however, our profits had become far less than optimal. The humans did not stop there, for soon after the introduction of the new translators, we noticed a different sort of shift. One of our agents in human space began to report that the humans had started to develop a faster means of communication than the current system we had set in place. It was not secret project on the humans' part, as our agent had only learned of this development from the advertising campaign on part of human companies. We at first considered it nonsense, for while current FTL transmissions were certainly faster than they were before, but one could not simply make them fast enough to make up for the sheer distance these messages had to travel. Then we received reports of the contrary. Given the nature of intergalactic delays between communications at the time, most messages took the form of written or pre-recorded audio and visual files that were then sent throughout the galaxy. It was possible for instant or video messaging to occur between star systems that were close together, but eventually the delay would grow too large for the practice to be practical. That didn't really mean anything for my kind, but it was easy to detect the frustrations that the general populace had with such a situation. To know instant communication existed, but to also know that its capability was limited, made the current system we had set up to be a necessary evil rather than a convenience. Again, we were rather happy with this arrangement, and may or may not have encouraged the idea that there was no other way. The humans, of course, only looked at this as a challenge. The first intergalactic video chat aired 20 years after the signing of the Treaty of Itraxi. The humans, being humans, had aired the chat of a mother and her infant son. The backdrop of the son was that of Earth, while the mother had the planet of Yabbosash looming behind her. Now, of course, you may think this a rather trivial exchange, but what was significant about this was that Yabbosash was located in the Poros systems, which lay on the opposite side of the galaxy in relation to Earth, and there was no delay. The mother and her son were interacting like they were right in front of each other, the signal clear and instant. Implications of technology developed without our notice aside, the most alarming thing about this exchange was that we could not detect it. The recording of the video arrived to us nearly a week after it had occurred, and even then, it was a recording of the, the event taking place in a plaza, not the actual recording of the exchange itself. We could not find where the humans had bounced the signal from in our own relays, for such an exchange to have occurred without leaving a trace would have been impossible. 
That could have only meant one thing, that the conversation was happening off the grid. We had at first thought it a hoax. Video is a very simple thing to edit in this day and age, making it very easy to fake certain events to make them see like reality. But as soon as the video arrived to us, we also received reports of humans deploying a new type of relay. These were larger, bulkier, and emitted a power signal that dwarfed that of many starships. To think it a simple relay seemed naive, but reports of the device said that was all it was. FTL communication systems could be detected going into the relay, but we could not detect to where they were going. This only confirmed our fears. The humans had developed a new method of broadcasting, and it was totally independent of the current system we had put into place. Not only that, but if the recording that was sent to us was anything to go by, it was far faster and far more effective than what we had to offer. Given what I have already said of my kind, you can imagine that there was a certain degree of, let us say, discontent among my kind after this revelation. We scanned over all of the information we had kept over the past twenty years, wondering if there was anything we had missed that could have warned us of this folly on our part. But the answer wasn't in our database. It was in the very recording sent to us. I knew the mother in the video. It didn't quite register at first, for she was a bit older than she had been when I first met her, but when I looked at the video once again, I realized who she was. There was a scientist by the name of Elka Aligard who had approached ten years before this event. Like many scientists across the galaxy, the absence of any sort of regulation in the Poros systems had attracted Elka to our destination. She had come with the proposal of developing a new method of space travel. The space displacement drive operates on the ability to bend space around an object. By expanding space behind a ship and contracting it in front of the vessel, it allows for the vessel to travel at speeds faster that light can accomplish. What Aligard has suggested, however, was rather than travelling through space itself, would it not be better to skip it altogether? She proposed what she called the Aligard Wormhole Generator, a piece of technology that would create a wormhole in normal space that would connect two distant points together. It was something that could not be installed in ships and would have to be managed by gates set up at certain points throughout the galaxy. It was certainly a fine proposal, but the problem, we realized but that she had yet to discover for herself, was that development of a large enough wormhole that could transport spaceships required the generation of an amount of power that was, at least at this time, impossible. Perhaps we could have, but the issue with such a piece of tech was that it would be so obscenely expensive to develop just one of these devices that to replicate it throughout the galaxy would result in not only the Poro systems going bankrupt, but a majority of the galaxy going into economic decline. Given how unproven the method was, we opted to reject her proposal, and Elka had returned to UPN space. It appears she never gave up on her goal, just made it more realistic. By the time that the humans deployed these new relays across their own territory, the Coalition and Empire had become quite interested in the power behind this new, faster method of communication. At that moment, a number of design plans and leaks spread throughout the ICS, ones in which we were very quick to snatch up when spotted. Aligard had reduced the size of her proposed wormhole, and to say by many factors would be an understatement. Her proposed wormhole was no bigger the size of an infrared wave, invisible to the human eye. What this change in size had done, however, was make the necessary power required to generate one far more realistic to achieve than her original proposal. The size and power output of the new relays then made sense. They were in fact wormhole generators, but with the purpose of shortening the distance of communication, not necessarily travel. We, of course, began to develop our own version of these relays, with the same backdoors as before,
but the Empire and Coalition seem to be more resistant to the idea of letting us install these into their space. The fact that the humans had developed this new method of communication on their own instilled a sense of competition among the Coalition and Empire. They did not want to be left behind by the humans, and in turn did not want to be reliant upon their aid. To that effect, they did not wish to be reliant on our aid either, though the Coalition was far more willing to pay for a number of key pieces of information that we possessed. We could not persuade them otherwise, which meant by the time that the new relays had been developed and deployed across the galaxy, the ICS was rendered obsolete by the Aligard Communications Network, or ACN. What the installation of the ACN had done to the galaxy may not have reduced the time of physical travel, but it made it a far more connected place than it had once been before. The Galnet, a galactic version of the internet system that all the powers had developed, had come about as a result of this new broadcasting system. The idea was previously thought impossible with the ICS, for while the relay system we had developed made FTL communications not as easy to break apart, it was still too little to make up for the time delay between signals. With the ACN, however, distance was no longer an issue. By transmitting signals at FTL speeds and bouncing them through the wormholes located within these relays, transmitting and spreading data could occur within a matter of seconds. No longer did you have to wait a week to hear back from a loved one, and no longer were business exchanges done via long, drawn-out negotiations via mail. Everything was quick, fast, and interconnected now, and by connecting everyone's already developed internet infrastructures, the Galnet came into being within the span of a year past the installation of the ACN. There were two problems that came about as a result of this. The first, most obvious problem, was the fact that the ICS, which we had developed and deployed across the galaxy, was now useless to our efforts. Our source of information, and in turn a large source of our profits, had been effectively eliminated with the introduction of the ACN and by this new sense of security that the Coalition and Empire seemed to have developed. We may or may not have developed a similar system of information in the Poros systems, but that is where the second problem comes into play. The delay of communications in the ICS had allowed us to sift through a lot of the information as it passed by. Think of it as a steady trickle of information that could be easily digested. What the ACN had done with its new system, however, was turn this easily managed trickle into an unending flood of information. For every important, crucial document that could be fished from the depths, there were at least 5,000,000 other frivolous messages or exchanges that had to be sifted through. As you can imagine, managing this flow is difficult to say the least, and as a result has made it a more realistic measure to keep our information gathering confined within the Poros systems. I shudder to imagine what kind of information I'm missing out on, yet I do not wish to suffer the threat of losing my own sanity to triviality once again. Our information business is not as powerful as it once was, but we still manage to make a profit, and that is enough for now. But now there have been intrusions into our market, as this new, much more vast system of communication has in fact created a sum competition in the espionage department. It is much easier to hide in the muck of everyday exchange, and that had caused a number of other rivals to appear out of the woodwork. The origins of these new organizations did not matter, for what really mattered was that we were no longer the sole brokers of information. The humans had pushed us back to even ground with the rest of the galaxy, and they most likely didn't even know it. As much as I have spoken of the human consciousness, I feel that I have yet to properly illustrate how dynamic their minds can be. Yes, there are plenty of humans that are fairly simple affairs to manipulate, 
albeit requiring a little bit more effort than most species, but there are some that prove to be far more troublesome than most. Perhaps it would be better to use a personal example. Conflict between Thulus is a fairly rare event, but is something that does happen among my species, generally between two Thulus, that hold a certain vested interest in their dealings throughout the galaxy. Given the vast nature of space, these dealings do not intersect with one another very often, but when they do, we deal with them like we would anything else through the shadows. Such was the case when I found myself in conflict with a younger member of our species, Biate. Now to say Biate was younger doesn't mean much for such a long-lived species such as us numerically, but there is still a more noticeable difference in mindset amongst the younger members of our species. They tend to be more aggressive, more likely to manipulate through their gifts, rather than through negotiations like myself and the older members of our species. Such bullheadedness has been the source of our inner conflicts, though we of the older generation do get sick of each other from time to time, leading us to address that problem in our own way. Regardless of who we are conflicting with, both sides generally come out relatively unharmed. In this particular instance, that was not the case. My conflict with Beate occurred some months ago, deep in the loft system. To call this particular star system barren would be an understatement, as the only two planetoid shapes hovering near Lof were too close to be habitable. That did not mean they did not serve as valuable caches for our goods, should we ever need to protect them from outside forces. Each Thulu held their own caches in similar barren systems, but to find out the location of these caches is an arduous task to say the least. Of course, I happened to, let us say, stumble upon the location of Biate's cache in the Lof system, buried deep into the planet of Foley's. He had been storing up quite the collection of palladium, a crucial element in the construction of the life support functions on spaceships. Recent improvements to life support designs had been made, and with a little bit of suggestion of Beate's part, had been pushed through without much testing. He also leaked the documents out to a number of the developers' competitors, which in turn caused them to develop and rush out their own version of this new life support system. The key resource needed for all of this was, of course, palladium. It was a smart move, if not hasty, as these new modules had a much higher failure rate than the last model, but any blame for such designs was placed on the manufacturer, not Beate himself. If anything, it benefited him more, for the resulting recall and replacement of these failed devices made the demand for palladium all the more higher in the Poros systems, something of which he was prepared to capitalize on. I was of the same mind, having discovered the Thulu's intentions far before his machinations began. I may have even assisted with the process a little bit, though I must admit that my intent wasn't purely economical in this instance. Beate had grown far too aggressive over the last few years, coming into conflict with his fellow Thulu more than what was considered normal. He seemed intent on sabotaging our operations, hoping to sweep up and take a profit afterwards. More often than not, however, it resulted in a series of scuffles that left both parties worse off than they originally were. I could not fully blame him, for his desires were normal among the younger generation, but action needed to be taken. I had only intended to, let us say, deliver a message when raiding his storehouse, but things did not go as I thought they would when the operation was executed. Normally, when fighting amongst ourselves, we Thulu used the Ivalu, or Migu, as our ground troops. Both possessed enough physical strength to hold their own against most in the galaxy, and our familiarity with the workings of both species' minds made it simple to direct them to where we saw fit. For this particular mission, though, I opted to hire a group of human mercenaries led by a man who went by the name of Elijah Samad. Much to my disappointment, however, all them were the same. 
Perhaps I should rephrase my statement. The ones among Elijah's crew all held a very similar mindset, and that was the pursuit of money, regardless of what needed to be done. It is natural for such things, if I were to be honest, as like-minded people have a habit of collecting together, even us Thulu, but what was disappointing about this crew was how similar they all thought to one another. While this meant that their dynamic as a group would most likely be cohesive and effective, they, in that aspect, were not so much different than the Rezanagar in that regard. If Biate could break one, then he could use the same methods to break the rest, and this particular crew didn't look all that difficult to break. No offence to them, of course. As with any group, there were a few exceptions amongst the crew, namely what I identified to be the squad leaders. There were five in total, leading ten men each. Elijah himself, from what I could read of the man, shuffled his leadership among the different squads as a way of reminding his crew of who was in charge. His squad leaders were Glenn, Bradley, Orica, Leo, and Doran. None of them presented any individual threat as far as I could tell, but their thoughts were more guarded, calculated than the rest of the men that they led. I suppose this was the result of any hierarchy, but from what I could tell of them, they all appeared to have different methods to their leadership. What little I could delve from their minds, without alerting them to my presence, Glenn and Leo were the so-called swords of the crew, leading their squads in a more offensive manner than the rest, while Bradley and Doran were the shields who followed a more defensive maneuver. Orica herself seemed to be more of a wild card, switching from defense to offense when needed, though it appeared that her squad was often used more for recon than anything else. I had hired Elijah's crew due to the stories of their constant shuffling tactics, and perhaps this variation among his squad leaders were the reason for it. There were, however, two men outside of Elijah's crew that caught my attention. I say, they were outside of Elijah's crew, due to the fact that they seemed so out of place, both in personality and mentality. They went by the names of Christopher Keegan and Tycho Brennan. Beyond that, I could not acquire any more information from them. Much like Stephen Henry, they kept much of their thoughts guarded, but how they did so was drastically different from one another. When a human puts their mental guard up, there is a certain awareness about them that tends to manifest itself in different forms. For Stephen, his guard took the simple form of a wall, a strong wall, as we were unable to break it before he left, but the simplest manifestation of a mental guard I have seen. With Chris and Tycho, however, there was something off-putting about their protectiveness. It was not the act itself, as that was expected due to the proximity of my ship next to Elijah's, but rather how their mental blocks took shape. Tycho's took the form of what appeared to be an empty void. Jokes about empty-headedness aside, it felt more like my gaze into his psyche was redirected somehow into a blank space of his subconscious, one that operated more off instinct rather than thought. There was, of course, nothing of use to be found there, but I could not manage to delve into any other spot of the man's mind, which I admit befuddled me for a moment. It was a defense of misdirection, not outright resistance. Chris's defenses, on the other hand, took the shape of something far more interesting. When I delved into his mind, I was met by a barrage of mental imagery that was erotic, to say the least. I do not wish to be explicit, but to say that it was merely images of naked women would be putting it lightly. Moral questionings of the man notwithstanding, the torrent of images that met my curiosity was enough to make me pause momentarily. It was fully unexpected, and perhaps that was what made it so effective. You would be unable to guess such a mental defense from the man, as his outward appearance took a more casual facade than his mentality suggest, so to be met by that barrage of imagery was jarring. He must have felt my presence in his mind, for the moment I left it I caught him smirking. In reality, 
I had only figured out the two's names due to the fact that I had bribed a number of Elijah's men into wearing transmitters that relayed audio and visual information to my ship. I mainly did this in order to monitor the crew during the mission, but it proved to be fairly useful as a small study into human interaction. Chris and Tycho, in particular, kept most of my attention during our flight to Foley's, and that was mainly because of the reasons I have already described. They were the ones that perhaps met my expectations the most. I could not predict their behaviours, and their mental blocks gave me little to infer from other than the fact that it meant that they were particularly strong-willed, even more so than the squad leaders. Their interactions with the crew, however, suggested that they were men that didn't have much to hide in the first place, as they were quite sociable with the rest of Elijah's men. If I were to merely judge them by their own outward interactions, they seemed to be the least threatening of the group. However, their apparent mental strength made me somewhat wary of them, though in a way it was reassuring, as their opponent was also another Thulu. The possibility of Beate being on Pholus was low, however, as the information I acquired from one of his agents indicated that Pholus was currently operating under a skeleton crew that amounted to the number of men that Elijah was leading. Granted, equal odds were not the most reassuring of situations, but perhaps I had put more stock in the stories of human combat prowess than I cared to admit. I relayed most of the information I acquired from Bayate's agent to Elijah, who in turn outlined the plan to his crew. Their duty was to conduct an assault on Pholus with the purposes of extracting or destroying the supply of palladium that was stored within. There would be better pay if the palladium was just extracted, of course, which Elijah took as the only course of action. The logistical problem with that, however, was that thousands of tons of palladium was stored within Pholus. While I was aware of the Thulu's machinations, that amount suggested that he'd been far more subtle than I had realized, which impressed me in some ways. Chris and Tycho were especially skeptical of their ability to move so much palladium in a reasonable amount of time, but beyond a few voice concerns, they did nothing. I should note here that conducting any sort of combat operation in the Poros systems requires a certain amount of preparation on part of its combatants. Due to our large presence within the systems, many of Elijah's men were equipped with dampeners that lined the insides of their helmets. These dampeners functioned much like a Faraday cage, if I were to use a human example, in that they prevent interference from our own powers due to the compositions of their materials. It was a shockingly simple defense when discovered, but it is also due to that simplicity that makes it possible for us to slip our way past such defenses with just a little bit more application of effort than we would normally require. Still, for the purposes of combat, it was effective in delaying any possible manipulation on part of another Thulu. Of course, it would also help to have your own mental defences like Chris and Tycho had developed, but most of Elijah's squad leaders had a certain degree of resilience on their part to put up a steady defence. In this case, the dampeners were not really necessary due to Bayate's absence, but I was in agreement with Elijah's crew in this instance to err on the side of caution. The plan to assault the cache would play out in the following way. They would set off an EMP on the surface to disable any perimeter defenses that Beate has equipped his installation to. Elijah and his men would then commit an assault to break into the compound, locate the palladium and move it to the surface. Should Elijah and his men manage to wipe out the crew occupying the cache, extraction would be simple, but that depended mainly on their combat capabilities. I myself would be playing the role of monitor, more out of curiosity rather than any necessity. There is an unspoken agreement amongst my people, one that makes our conflicts fought between those under us, but never with each other directly. Given our low reproduction rate, it made sense for such measures to be enacted early in our civilization's development, but now it was more akin to a code of conduct than anything else, one that suited us just fine. 
The Evalu and Megu were expendable, and in this case so were Elijah and his men. That did not stop us from having a hand in directing military operations, but again, I had opted to use a human crew in this case, which made such a task difficult to manage. No, this was just as much an experiment as it was teaching Biate a lesson, and when the initial assault began, I believed things to go smoothly. Elijah and his men met little resistance entering the Folus compound, and in fact had cut a steady path deeper into the complex in no time at all. Some of his men fell to the Ivalu stationed in the area, but to describe what they met as a skeleton crew would be egregious at best. They could not have met with no more than a dozen Ivalu soldiers on their way into the compound, which alarmed me. Biate may have been the stingy sort, but he was never one to leave his assets that unguarded. That and the placement of the Palladium was suspect, as it was in the furthest reaches of the deepest storage house of the complex. It was easy to see, but to place raw materials, rather than something more, antiquated in such location was strange to say the least. These suspicions were confirmed, however, when Elijah's crew came under fire. To say that Beate's initial assault was surprising would be doing it an injustice. Ivalu, possibly over two hundred in number, had burst forth from the storage containers in the warehouse and caught the humans off guard. Their initial assault all but crippled Leo and Doran's squads, cutting their defensive and offensive abilities in half from the get-go. The rest of the humans took cover behind other storage containers. Some of the men that did this found themselves only face to face with more Ivalu, and their resulting screams spelled out their fate. Elijah had managed to form up his men around the Palladium's location, doing so most likely upped their chances for survival. Elijah most likely did not know this himself, but Beate's own money-hungry nature would have prevented him from damaging the Palladium in any way, which meant that the use of any largely destructive weapons was limited on his part. This meant that the Ivalu were restricted to conventional weaponry, something of which was easily defended against with simple cover. I say this was Biate's assault, and not the Ivalus, due to the movement of his troops. They were too coordinated, too unified to be under their usual direct when left to their own directions, which mean the Thulu had taken up position somewhere within the complex itself, waiting for Elijah's assault. It did not take me long to realize that I had been tricked. Bayate's agent had been nothing more than a ruse, someone to feed me information that, in turn, made Elijah's crew all the more susceptible to a surprise attack such as this. I must admit it was a clever ploy, especially since the agent had made herself just as difficult, if not even more so, to find and break than anyone else, which made me all the more ready to accept such information. I suppose I could have aided Elijah's men somehow, maybe by interfering with Beate's control over the Ivalu, but at that point I found it a futile effort. Indeed, when Elijah fell under a hail of gunfire due to this miscalculation, I couldn't help but feel impressed by Beate's maneuver. He had won this exchange, or so I believed. By the time Elijah had been killed, his men had been reduced to little more than a dozen people. Leo and Bradley had fallen as well, leaving only Orica, Glenn and Doran the remaining squad leaders. However, rather than any of them taking charge after their captain's death, Chris had taken up a leadership role amongst them. They were all shaken, of course, not only from the hopeless situation around them, but also influence of Beate off from a distance. So, their dampeners, it appeared, had not managed to completely shield them from his influence, and slowly but surely he had begun to inflame the panic that sat at the back of each of their heads all except for Chris and Tycho, both of whom were strangely calm under fire. It could have very much been them merely masking their own fear at such overwhelming odds, but as the other men screamed over their comms, Chris and Tycho maintained their positions, maintaining enough fire to prevent the Ivalu from advancing too close to their position. 
their movements off one another, while not as clearly coordinated as the Ivalu under Biate's control, played off one another in an almost symphonic-like fashion. As soon as one went to reload, the other opened fire, and they covered each other's flanks without needing to communicate their situation. It was still futile in the end, however, as the sheer number of the Ivalu would eventually overtake them, but still they maintained their position. The other men must have been rallied by this action, for eventually all of them started to push through Biate's mental manipulations and assist the men in their defence. They had split themselves between the two, a little more than half a dozen following Chris and the others falling in rank behind Tycho. It was then that the tide began to turn. Without much other options, the remainder of Elijah's men put their trust in the two unlikely leaders. And in a matter of minutes, another plan was concocted, quickly coined by Chris as Operation Fortitude. What it entailed I had very little idea, but it began with an action that any normal soldier, even a Thulu such as I, considered to be very foolish. Chris had taken off his helmet. Though obviously a dangerous thing to do in a firefight, it was even more of a foolhardy maneuver due to the presence of a Thulu in the battle. The result was expected, as Chris soon fell to his knees as soon as the helmet left his head, but he did not crumple as I thought he would. Rather, he stood back up. His legs were shaking, and he had a clear expression of pain displayed across his face, but for the most part his movements had not slowed. This was not the only thing that happened, for the mental pressure I felt amongst his crew had disappeared altogether as well, with all of it focused on Chris alone. I was unsure if this was a manoeuvre on Beate's part to cripple the man as fast as possible, but it was clear that Chris had intended for such a result. More out of curiosity rather than concern, I delved into Chris's mind. I had expected to find a mind in the process of falling to pieces, but I was greeted by something that was perplexing, to say the least. It was as if I was looking at the situation directly through his eyes. His shaking was still there, and I could still detect faint traces of pain crying out from his subconscious. My touch in this case, was a fair bit more deft than my fellow Thulu, which meant the action had not put any more strain on the man's mind, but I could not help but be confused by what I saw. There was no sign of defence on Chris's part, as the mental defence I knew he possessed never hit me on the way in. Perhaps Bayate had completely decimated it with raw mental force, but even then there should have been some trace of it in the man's mind. Instead, I only saw what he saw, and felt what he felt. There was fear, of course, but to the degree that normally only drove men to action rather than paralyzing them, like it had done with Elijah in his final moments. Along with the fear, however, was a large sense of determination, which in this case was only to the man's detriment. You see, that amount of determination made one's mind fairly easy to interpret, which made them easy to predict. Granted, the force behind such actions with this determination would make it difficult to guard against, but force was not something that Chris had on his side. So, as he ordered the remaining men to move, I prepare myself for them to be wiped out. And they were. Before he could order his men to move away from their current position and break right, Bayate had picked up the thought and moved his men accordingly. When Chris's men moved from their position, half of them were mowed down from gunfire before they could retreat back into cover. Chris's sense of panic rose at the sight of this, and slowly I felt his breaths start to elevate. Every time he ordered his men to move which way, Bayate caught it beforehand and moved the Ivalu to a position that easily whittled away at Chris's men. Soon, it was just Chris who was left alone, and he had started to fully panic, shivering in behind cover as the Ivalu slowly started to close in. It was a pathetic sight and truly disappointing to see, for I had expected far more from the like of the man, given what I had seen of his mental defences. That was the first sign that told me something was wrong, and Beate must have felt it too, 
for he left the man's mind in a rush that startled even me. It was panicked, almost, and when I took myself from Chris's mind, I realized why. Where Chris had been sitting, or where I saw that he was sitting, was now a large, scorched section of the storehouse, along with scores of dead Ivalu. A large section of the palladium supply had been destroyed, and it looked as if numerous munitions that could be found around the warehouse had been piled into where they were located and then detonated. The resulting explosion had not only decimated the supply of palladium that Beate had stocked up on, but had also wiped out a large score of Ivalu as well, the Ivalu that he had ordered to converge on Chris's location towards the end of what I saw in the man's mind. Instead of a cowering man waiting for them, however, what had really been in wait was a trap set up by Chris and his men, who were now making their way towards the exit of the storehouse. Perhaps now would be a good time to explain what exactly transpired. What Chris had done was drawn both myself and Beate into a mental creation of a scene. His initial mental defense of crude imagery was in itself a ruse, for it hid the true nature of his mental defenses. Rather than a barrage of shocking visuals, Chris's true mental defense lie in his own imagination and the ability to craft a mental scene in his head that was, for the most part, believable. In this case, he had created a scene that Bayate wanted to see and that was the complete and utter slaughter of all the humans under Bayate's might. Under this manipulation, Bayate had ordered his men to react to events that weren't actually happening, which gave Chris and his men the ability to maneuver and set up the trap they needed to before finally drawing in the Ivalu to its clutches. In retrospect, I should have saw it coming soon, as Chris's own panicked image of himself was far more exaggerated than it should have been. The entire scene was melodramatic in a way, as the men screamed far more and cried for help more often than they had been under Elijah's command. Yet, it took advantage of perhaps the biggest weakness of our capabilities, and that was when we delve into enough minds at once. We lose visual perception of our surroundings. When Biate manipulated over 200 Ivalu, as well as attacked Chris's psyche to the degree he had, there was little chance that he was aware of what was actually happening in his storehouse. You may question why the Ivalu did nothing to counter this offensive, but that ties into Biate's own mental manipulations as well. He had assumed direct control of each of the Ivalu in this case, which meant that what he saw, they saw which shut out their perceptions of the outer world entirely. Normally, this would not be an issue, since the Thulu in control would instead relay and manipulate the Ivalu much like a puppet master, and in effect, treat the Ivalu like they would any other limb. It is highly effective most of the time, especially for the more combat-adept members of my species, which Biate was a part of. However, in this case it was not so effective, which made the effect all the more pronounced when Bayate was outwitted. Though his actions were stalled, the Thulu redoubled his efforts to eliminate Chris and his men. He had more Ivalu stationed among the rest of his storehouses, which the humans had to make their way through in order to make it out of the compound. They were not as numerous as they had been in the initial assault, but it was enough of a force slowly pushed the humans back as they were met by the wrath of an angered Thulu. Before, he had carefully maneuvered the Ivalu to minimize the casualties they would receive, as Beate was always stingy even when it came to men. But in his angered state, he no longer cared for conserving the members of his crew. He threw wave after wave at Chris and his men, but somehow the humans had managed to survive. A few of them were struck down, but it appeared that their successful deception from before had galvanized them. Biate did not stop trying to attack Chris's mind, however, as the Thulu most likely felt some sense of pride that did not allow him to be outsmarted by a mere human. Yet he was, for even after diving into Chris's mind once again with far more force, the man had managed to stay on his feet long enough for another deception— 
This one was a far more simple affair, where rather than constructing another mental scene, he began to scramble his vocal and mental orders to confuse the Thulu's own manipulation of his troops. He would tell his men to go right, but in his mind say tell them to go left, and at times his men under Tycho's direction either followed the vocal order or did the exact opposite of what was said. Sometimes they would act completely autonomously, performing a maneuver that neither followed Chris's mental direction or what he said. The chaotic, shuffling nature of these operations made the humans almost impossible to predict, which initially meant that the humans would frequently flank the Ivalu and cut down the men enough to move to the next storehouse. Eventually, Biate started to spread the Ivalu out evenly, though the storehouses but that in turn had spread his defences thin, which, under the concentrated might of the humans, meant that their progress was not halted. This was not without its consequences, however, as Chris was starting to falter behind his men, as the mental strain grew too heavy for him to fully manage. It was at this point that he and Tycho switched their roles. Chris placed his helmet back on while Tycho removed his, and once again Biate took the bait. His pride was too much to merely ignore such an open target, and it was as if the humans were counting on this to happen. Tycho had even taunted the Thulu into attacking him, and Beate obliged. His defense, however, had a different effect on the Thulu's commands. I myself did not peer into Tycho's mind, as I had with Chris's, but the effect he had upon Beate's manipulations were immediate. It appeared that rather than deceiving him with false orders, Tycho had instead caused a delay between the Thulu and the Ivalu. Perhaps it had something to do with that void I had seen in his mind before, and that somehow was causing an interference within Bayate's mental signal. Regardless, it meant that the Ivalu had a second delay from the moment that Bayate relayed his orders and when they received them. It was enough for their meager defenses to crumble. And though Beate had attacked Tycho with even more force than he had Chris, the man had managed to hold out long enough to make it to the extraction point, where he quickly placed the helmet back on his head. Were I in the young Thulu's position, I would have just let the humans leave. They may have devastated a large portion of his potential profits, and had also destroyed much of the inventory in the storehouses on the way out, but their actions to that point had proven to be too volatile and unpredictable to warrant pursuit. However, I was not my younger compatriot, and his actions possessed far less tact than I would have approached the situation with. It is not common for Thulus to enter combat themselves, but that does not mean that our own physical bodies are by any means weak. So when Beate charged the remaining humans with on his own, Needless to say, they were caught off guard. It was not only an assault from his physical body, however, but also his mental self, the form of a large toad-like creature with a singular eye, which even with the dampeners they had equipped was enough to cripple Chris and his crew momentarily while the Thulu struck. I would say that he attacked with the grace and strength representative of our race, but in reality the sight looked nothing more than a mass of tentacles swinging about and snatching the crew up before they could act. A number of the humans died in the assault, but some of the humans, though I could not tell which, managed to push past the crippling effect of Bayate's mental self and fire into the Thulu's face. It was not enough to pierce Bayate's body armor, but it had kept the Thulu distracted long enough for the dropship to ram into the Thulu from behind. The blow was enough to loosen his grip upon the humans, who then made a break for the drop and escaped to their main ship. They jumped out of the system without warning, though I could not blame them for doing so. Beate had a few choice words to say to me but he managed to rein his anger in before attacking me as well, which would have been a grievous error on his part. I was not contacted by the remnants of Elijah's crew for some time after the event, but I received a message from Chris and Tycho a few days after the event. It contained nothing more than a request for more pay, which, given what they had gone through, I felt obliged to pay. I was not as close-guarded as some of my fellow Thulus, 
and the struggle those two had to endure was more than enough to justify the payment. More than that, however, it gave me an insight into the human mind that further clarified what they were capable of as a species. I knew the humans to be unpredictable, but to see the extent at which they could be so was enlightening, to say the least. Though I did not realize it at the time, Chris and Tycho had apparently built up quite the reputation in the Fractus systems, one that properly reflected their performance on Pholus quite accurately. It is hard to separate fact from fiction, due to the uncertain nature from such an unstable region as the Fractus systems, but only one thing seemed to be certain about these men. And that was wherever they went. Chaos followed. I suppose I should end this with another more personal account of mine. Before I begin, however, it should be said that human mental resilience is not wholly dependent on deception or deflection. There are a few that are just simply near impossible to break, but also those that use more interesting tactics to surprise us. The most recent example I can say of this was a business meeting with a man by the name of Edward Abbott. He was a trader from the human nation of Britannia and had come to negotiate a deal with me about a number of Farshah artifacts that we discovered within the Poros systems. How he got such information was a mystery unto itself, as the usual clients we had for such technology originated from coalition space. But it piqued my curiosity enough to arrange a meeting with the man. I must elaborate on who exactly Edward Abbott was, or rather, who he wasn't. You see, when I looked into the man, I found that he was pretty much a nobody in the realm of trading. Many of my contacts had not even heard of the man, and even the few feelers I had out in UPN space had a difficult time finding out anything about him that I could have used to prepare myself for our meeting. To be completely honest, I found that revelation to be somewhat refreshing. Too often have I found myself already knowing the people I meet before seeing them with my own eyes, so the opportunity to meet a relatively unknown individual was in a way more akin to the olden days of my dealings. The most I knew of Edward was that he was a trader, and that he lived within the nation of Britannia. Beyond that, there was virtually nothing. Of course, given enough time, I would be able to learn any secrets the man has hidden within his mind, but for the initial impressions, I was essentially going in blind. We had arranged the meeting on the outskirts of the Poros systems, somewhere near the coalition planet of Lyca IV. It was a fairly good spot, if I was to be honest, as Lyca IV itself was a mining planet that possessed only a small amount of actual organic life who were present to operate the machinery. That meant that there was little to no chance of our negotiations to be interrupted. Abbott's ship was very much like his background, bland and not all that distinctive, and given that impression I expected the man to operate like most did with us, Thulu, and that was to conduct negotiations from ship to ship rather than face to face. Our size tends to intimidate the weaker-willed members of the galactic community, and our ability automatically instill a sense of caution from those that interact with us. A wise caution, if I was to be objective, as many in the galaxy operated in such a way, though I'd say our range is a little more broad than just the confines of our ships. However, Abbott had insisted upon meeting in my own ship, which was, was the first sign that this man was a deviation from the norm. Perhaps even more startling was the fact that the man boarded my ship with no signs of protection. Rather, he merely wore what I assumed was an older form of human business attire, and that was a grey suit with a red tie. In fact, older would be a fairly accurate word to describe Edward. Or perhaps, antiquated would be more accurate. He looked to be taken straight from the beginnings of the 21st century, his hair was greying, but cut neat and short, and he was clean-shaven, a style that, upon an unassuming face such as his, made his expressions fairly easy to read. In fact, that would be the most accurate way to describe this man, 
was that he was very much like an open book, and at first that disappointed me somewhat. You must understand, for such a long-lived species such as ours, we come across a wide spectrum of personalities that for the most part fall into a series of categories that become much like clockwork to predict. Many of our interactions rarely require any sort of mind-reading anymore, since we can now predict and react to moves of people from any species depending on their cultural and personal backgrounds. We have been at this for a long time, and I am proud to say that in a face-to-face -face negotiation, there are very few people out there that could possibly match up to us. I had assumed that Abbott, from his background and my initial impressions of his appearance, was a man that was merely easy to read, a man that could be easily swayed and judged based on his own reactions and emotions. It would be simple for me to get the deal I wanted out of the man if he could even pay my price in the first place, and I had predicted the negotiations to only last a few minutes before he either left defeated or under my terms. And that is perhaps where my first mistake in dealing with Abbott was made. Perhaps one of the most important decisions in setting up a deal is in setting up the environment in which the negotiations would take place. Given Abbott's instance in meeting within my ship, I found that meeting in my quarters would be the ideal location to discuss our terms. Given my size, the room itself would be considered massive by human standards and its sparse decor meant that his attention would be wholly focused upon me in the negotiations. Also factoring in my size, the seat he would have to sit in would allow me to loom over him, which would of course trigger some sort of biological reaction that would instantly make the man wary and feel pressured against. It had been some time since I had such an ideal setting, and I intended to take a full advantage of it. When he arrived, however, Abbott reacted in a way that went against my expectations. Rather, it would be more appropriate to say that he did not react at all, to anything. He merely sat down in his seat and smiled up at me, which I shall admit gave me pause. How do you do, Mr. Rullier, was it? I do apologize in advance for any mispronunciation on my part, it appears that even translators cannot accommodate the fickleness of the tongue, he said. His voice definitely rang true of his Britannia origins, but much like the rest of his appearance, it held an older feel of days long past. Pay it no mind, I said, accompanied by a pattern of bioluminescence that is my species' version of a polite smile. Hardly anyone ever does get the dialect right, it is to be expected. Still, I am curious. I have noticed that a number of your kind share the same surname, but are not biologically related. May I ask why that is? I looked at the man, unsure of what he was going for with that question. The man could have easily gotten his answer from a quick search on the galnet, but I decided to humor him, if not for the sake of politeness. Our surnames are linked to our home cities or rather which city we have presided over for the longest, to make more sense. I spent most of my time within Relier, and some others have as well. It is not usually a problem, as we hardly use such surnames these days anyway. I see. Shall I perhaps refer to you by your other name, then? It is of no concern to me. Use what you wish. He nodded. Right, then. You must excuse me. There is a lot to the galaxy outside of UPN space that I have yet to experience, and I much prefer getting the information straight from the horse's mouth, if you understand what I'm saying. I am familiar with the phrase. Good, he said, his smile widening. Now then, enough small talk. It has come to my attention that you are currently in the possession of a number of the Timeless One's artifacts. I do indeed possess such artifacts, though I must ask, how did you acquire such information? Not even my most regular buyers have found this out. I cannot tell you that, unfortunately. I peered at the man, which normally resulted in some sort of fidgeting from anyone else. Abbott sat still, however, and looked at me with the same small smile. I understand.
I eventually said, it would be unwise for a businessman to reveal his sources. Oh, it is not necessarily a matter of that. It is that I was merely told to come here and negotiate a deal. Pardon? Yes, my client asked me to negotiate a deal with you for these artifacts, so here I am. You did not inquire further into how your client received this information. No, I did not. I find it usually within my best interest to focus upon the deal itself and what is asked of me. Crucial outside information notwithstanding, it does not good for a small trader such as myself to be caught up in any sort of espionage. Too much hassle, you see. As naive as this was, especially for a human that seemed to be in his later years, there was an efficiency to that methodology that I could appreciate. How effective it was, I had yet to see, but at that time I could only assume that the man was hiding something. He seemed to sense this scepticism of his words. You are a mind reader, are you not? Please, if it eases your worries, then look into my mind. I have nothing to hide. This offer was, of course, off-putting for a variety of reasons, but perhaps the biggest reason it was that never, beyond the most zealous of the Ivalu and the Migu, has a person invited a Thulu into their mind. That mental privacy, that ability to think your own thoughts without the worry of someone hearing them, is perhaps one of the most universal coveted things throughout the entirety of the galaxy. It is perhaps the sole primary reason that we Thulu are often looked at with such scepticism and wariness that for the most part a member of any species will only interact with us through methods that ensure their mind won't be opened to an outside force. Even us Thulu are in partial agreement with this, which is the large reason that most of us are separated from one another in the first place. Yet here was this man who had invited me into his mind as if it were the most casual thing in the world, without so much as a glancing flash of caution. You must understand that I most likely thought this to be a trap. It was too casual, too off the cuff for it to be merely an act of openness. Yet when I looked into the man's mind, I found that it was exactly what it said it was, a free look into the man's mind. What was shocking, however, was that there were no defences to the man at all. I sensed no misdirection, no resistance, no illusions. Instead, all I saw was who the man who Edward Abbott was. Memories flashed by. First of a young boy looking towards his mother. Outside lay a quiet neighbourhood, seemingly the quieter, more residential part of a city. It looked too ancient to be of this century, yet the memory is vivid, filled with a sense of nostalgia that was too powerful to have been fabricated. The boy's mother, by human standards, was not necessarily a beautiful woman, but the smile on her face seemed to have elicited a near overwhelming sense of warmth from the man's memories. She sat across from him, serving him a plate of what I assumed to be breakfast. The boy's father sat next to him, looking at a device similar to this century's PAs, yet far more primitive in design. They made their way to a vehicle, a rather long one at that, and soon the cheers of the crowd were muffled as the door was shut. The woman then fell into the man's arms, and they both sighed. He patted her on the shoulder, and she looked up at him, eyes full of hope, of happiness. Next came a scene that first alarmed me with its overwhelming sense of panic. The woman was screaming people, who I assumed to be of a medical profession, stood beside her, shouting out commands but also comforting the woman at the same time. The man stood beside her as well, holding on to a hand that tried its very hardest to crush his. He comforted the woman, telling her to stay strong, that she was almost done. He was right, for soon the screaming stopped replaced by the cry of a newly born child. One of the nurses passed the child on to the woman, who looked at the baby with a sense of joy that surpassed the one from the previous memory. She then gave the child to the man. He did not know how to hold the baby at first, but soon found a comfortable position to rest the child in the crook of his arm. 
It was a boy, eyes still closed, but his breathing still strong. At first, the man was again met by uncertainty, but a feeling of confusion as to what it all meant now that he held his son in his hands. Then, the child gripped on his shirt and pulled close to the man, and it all didn't matter. There was a sudden sense of alarm that followed as a rapid beeping noise seemed to interrupt the man's thoughts. The doctor took the man off to the side, and as the man looked back at his wife, the memory stopped her. What followed was another scene, taking place in what I assumed to be an office of some sort. Like everything in the man's memories, there was an antiquated feeling to the room, like was looking into something from days long past. The man sat at his desk, a picture of the woman kept in the corner of his vision at all times. When he looked at it directly, an emptiness echoed through the man's mind. It was distant, as if the man had already moved past the feeling, but it would never truly go away. His son sat on a couch off to the side, playing with toys in the shape of other humans. He was merely smacking them together and making noises that I assume were to serve as a replacement to actual sound effects. The man merely laughed at the scene, and soon the loss faded further into the background. The boy had grown, and while he was still a child, he could sense some of the boy's mother within him. That same innocence, that same pure-heartedness that his wife never lost was in the boy, and it comforted him somewhat. He patted his wife's picture and felt that everything was going to be all right. Another memory, this time of the man's child, walking with him in the midst of what looked to be an amusement park. The boy could still not participate in many of the rides, but he seemed to be happy enough running around the park itself. The man received a call in the midst of this memory and spoke briefly into a device that I could only guess was a phone of some sort. The voice on the other end requested the presence of the man at his work, but before the man answered, his eyes fell upon his son. His son appeared to be saddened, knowing what the call meant, as if this sort of event had become routine, yet inevitable given the man's profession. This time, however, the man looked upon his son, the guilt rising up in his chest, transforming into a different kind of resolve. He told the voice that he could not come, and though the voice sounded irritated, it pushed for nothing further. He hung up and held the boy's hand. The boy smiled, and that was all the man needed. There were multiple memories much like this, where the man would give up his opportunity in order to spend more time with his son. It meant that he never progressed beyond his current station, much to the chagrin of his superiors, but in exchange his relationship with his son remained strong. As long as he made enough to support his son, enough to where he could spend time with his son, then that would be enough. And it was enough, until the man eventually saw his son graduate from an institution that, given the prestigious nature of the processions, must have been one with quite the reputation at that time. His son was one of the few that help up his diploma triumphantly upon receiving it, beaming at his father from the stage. The son looked much like the man, but that smile, that glint in the corner of the boy's eyes that belonged to his mother. His son had eventually become a scientist, one working in a lab that, while primitive by today's standards, was showing signs of progression into what is used by humans in this day. There were a series of pods in the lab, large enough to hold a single person, though what they could do, the man did not seem to know. The son was slightly older than when he had graduated, but that spark in his eye had not faded. Though he could hardly keep up with half of what his son was saying, he was comforted by this fact. His son had invited him to take a tour of the lab, since the boy's work had kept him from seeing his father for some time. Still. They appeared to be close, which only further reassured the man that nothing had changed. But things did change. For once again, this peaceful memory was interrupted by the sound of an alarm. An explosion ripped through the lab, and the man found himself on his back, unable to breathe. His vision faded, and when it came to, he was looking back up to his son, 
who now looked down at him with a panicked expression. He was laying in one of the pods, the lid slowly closing down on him. Pain was screaming from every part of his body, and he felt the life fading from his fast. Before the pod closed, the last thing the man heard was that everything was going to be all right. When the pod opened, the man found himself in a room that was alien to him. The design was very much similar to how many space stations or ships were designed today, but for the man, it was like waking up in one of the throwaway novels of his childhood. There was another man there, a man dressed in clothing common to doctors of this time, but again unfamiliar to the man as he looked at him. The doctor explained to him that he had been asleep for a long time, and that the world had changed since he fell asleep. The man's wounds had been treated during his time asleep, but only after the technology to do so had been developed. It took a couple of centuries to do so, which is what had delayed his awakening. The man did not seem to care about this, however, and only asked where his son was. The doctor had again mentioned that he had been asleep for two hundred years, and then it finally dawned on him. His son was gone. For the first time since his wife's passing, the man cried. Time passed, and after the man acclimated to this new society around him, he was eventually given a collection of recordings by his son entitled Memories to My Father. The recordings themselves were mostly of his son speaking to a camera, first explaining the nature of the man's wounds and why they had to keep him in stasis for so long. The man had taken the brunt of the explosion that rocked his lab, and that had given the man not only severe surface damage to his skin, but also had damaged his internal organs past the point of repair for the technology at that time. His son explained that the only way to keep his father alive was to place him stasis, hopefully temporarily, so that he could eventually make strides to develop technology that will hopefully cure his father. That did not seem to matter to the man, however, for all that he saw was that the light had gone out of his son's eyes. That optimism, that spirit, it was gone, and that had hurt the man far more than the explosion had. The next few recordings were more explanations to the man's condition and what his son planned to do to treat his father. It was hard for the man to understand what his son was saying, but he merely listened to recordings at that point just to hear his son's voice. Up until that point, the man had remained in centre where he was woken up, afraid to venture out into the outside world, or worlds that lay in wait for him. More than that, he had no purpose, no drive anymore now that everyone he could have known was gone, now that his son was gone. Much like his son in the recordings, he had lost something important, and its place there was only uncertainty. Eventually, the nature of the recordings from his son started to change. They had gone from somber, technical expositions to mere retellings of events that happened in his son's life. Sometimes they were merely mundane things, such as what he had done that day, or what he was planning to do, but at times the man would catch something in his son's eyes, flickering back from time to time. His son, as the recordings continued on, had started to grow brighter, to speak in lighter tones, to find that sense of optimism that had been lost to him before. It became less about the son's attempts to fix his father, and more about his son attempting to speak to his father. His son spoke of the people he met, the friends he made, the woman he eventually married. Sometimes the son's wife would speak with him as well. She was a beautiful woman, one that matched his son perfectly. He eventually saw his own grandchildren, small, innocent and full of that same light that had returned to his son's eyes. He saw everything, and by the time that the recordings had ended, he felt as if he had missed nothing in his son's life, that he was by his son throughout the whole thing, and that granted him peace. The final recording was short, something spoken to the man in what he could only assume to be in the final years of his son's life. His son was far older than he was at that point, so much so that it was as if their roles had been switched, 
but his son still spoke to him in the same tone he always had. This last message was perhaps the most vivid in the man's mind. Father, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being there when you could, and being there even when you couldn't. Thank you for pushing me to be the man I am today, the man I know you always believed I could be. I know now I may never get to see you again, but talking to you like this, even if you were not in front of me, has been the one thing that has given me some sort of stability throughout the years. I was lost for a while, you know, as I'm sure you'll eventually see. I blamed myself, blamed fate for the conditions that caused you to be taken away from me, and for the longest time I tried to get you back. I still am, to be honest, and while I know that it may be a certainty to save you years from now, I am afraid I will no longer be around to see it. Yet, it feels as if you have never left me, that as you sleep in that pod I placed you into so many years ago that somehow you've been right there to keep me going. So again, thank you, Father. Thank you for everything. Everything I have is because you were there to push me forward, physically or spiritually, and I just want to let you know, for when you do wake up, that you do not need to worry about me. I've lived my life, and while it's had its own fair share of tragedies, I can't say I would change much about it. Now it's time to live yours. The world you wake up to may not be familiar to you, in fact it may very well be completely alien to you, but I know you can do it, Dad. You raised me right, and that's nothing to scoff about. So, thank you, Father, and if I do not see you in this life, I hope to see you in the next. The sun had cleared away the doubts from the man's mind. He had done the best job he had, and as a result, his son had lived a life that for all intents and purposes had been a fulfilling one. On the outside, it may have seemed like he had lost everything, but his son had filled in the void he felt after his awakening. His son had lived a happy life, and that, in the end, was everything. From then on, the man lived his own life, taking up the profession of a trader, if not only to explore the world around him. The people he met ranged from the important to the unimportant, but in the end it was merely meeting these people that interested him. It was, as his son had said, the galaxy was far more alien to him than he could have possibly imagined, but in the end the man could handle it, because his son believed he could. I reached a deal with Abbott shortly after and by the end felt that even though I most likely lost the profit I desired, I gained something else that made up for it. You may ask why I spent so much time describing Abbott's memories instead of our negotiations, and it is merely because that our negotiations were relatively short. Yes, there was the haggling and reaching a good middle ground of price, but upon receiving Abbott's memories, I realized that he was perhaps one of the most perfect negotiators a human could send to a Thulu. He had bared it all to me, and in the end I could find nothing to use against him. No secrets, no family, no leverage. Instead, all I got was a sense of who Edward Abbott was, and in effect, what drove Nathaniel Abbott, the father of modern human medical technology, in his pursuits. And that was the love between a son and his father. I may be a merchant, I may use, manipulate, and meddle with people to get what I want, but when a man comes at you with such openness, such willingness to share his story without so much as a care, there is a certain amount of respect that must be given in response. It could have been entirely possible for me to bend his will into giving me what I wanted, but he had disarmed that part of me with his honesty, and left me instead with the purest form of negotiation. As I have said before, it was refreshing, but I cannot say I would be willing to deal with such a situation once again, for profit's sake, of course. So when you ask me what I can say of humans, I can give you no definitive answer. There are those driven purely by ambition, those who channel the very chaos we claim to be, and those like Edward Abbott, so honest and upfront that it would be criminal to not reciprocate the honesty. 
There are those that would say, Thulus are the masters of the unknown. And while I'd be inclined to agree, I would know deep down that such an answer would hold some uncertainty. For in the end, there is no other species as mysterious as humanity. And I cannot say that is a bad thing, for if they were not around, our existence in this galaxy would truly be a dull one. Cthulhu Relier, Merchant of the Poros Systems